back to my channel. My name is Jenny. I wanted to try a new style of video and see how it goes. Uh, today I am putting the finishing binding onto a quilt that I've called, a quilt piece that I've called Autumn River. And I thought while I was doing the sewing live, uh, I would be chatting to you about four movies that I watched on Netflix while quilting this quilt. So uh, usually when I'm in the hand quilting stage of making work, I will watch something, uh, whether it's a TV show, YouTube, or uh, films. And so I decided to try out four films that are on network Netflix right now and then talk about them uh, while I was putting the binding on. Okay, so I did two um, features and two documentaries. And the first one I watched was the very long uh, Blonde, which is a film about Marilyn Monroe. And it was written the, the, based on a novel by Joyce Carol Oates. And I can't remember the year. I think it came out in 2022. Um, and it was written and directed by Andrew Dominic. I wrote some notes over here so I wouldn't forget uh, those details. I did, of course, forget to write down the name of the actress who played Marilyn Monroe. Um, she did a fairly, she did a great job. I remember that she was nominated for several awards, I think, for her performance. I thought her performance was good, but I could definitely tell that she had an accent. <laughs> so I found that quite distracting. Like, I knew, I could tell she wasn't American. Um, and I mean, that's okay. Um, I think she still did a good job in terms of her acting um, and I wouldn't want to like hold that against her but I think I'm pretty like for me something like that really takes you out of the experience if you can tell you can hear I could hear um, I believe that she is Spanish or Mexican or um, of a, of a Latin descent and so I could tell like that in her voice when she was doing her dialogue so I found it kind of distracting um, the other thing I will say is I was a huge I wouldn't say I'm as much of a fan of Marilyn Monroe now as I used to be when I was young I really loved um, her and I was drawn to her and I'm not exactly sure why I think many people are I think beyond her beauty um, which is the most obvious reason I think she had a warmth to her that was very alluring and um, and I think her story is just rather tragic and presented rather tragically uh, in the general media and so that made her another compelling um, character in 1950s film. So the portrayal of her life. So I have not read Blonde by Joyce Carol Oates. So I don't know how much of the script was pulled directly from the novel, how much it was just inspired. Um, but I have to say that I found the portrayal of her to be very much a victim perspective and I'm not going to say that um, her life wasn't difficult and she obviously did have many many challenges in her life and because this is a novelization of her life I also don't know how much of this um, film is based on fact and how much of it is conjecture or done for entertainment purposes but for me her life was just one kind of tragic experience after another and I also found that she was a very she was very sexualized so her the actress herself I found was very sexualized in the film um, and 
I think overly so. Obviously, Marilyn, Mon Marilyn Monroe was a very sexual woman. She was a, a sex symbol. She was objectified by the men and the culture around her at the time. And we can never know for sure how much of that she encouraged or wanted and how much of it she didn't want. But I found it very difficult to endure the kind of constant objectification, constant um, uh, reducing her down to her sexual experiences a lot, this story. Um, and also her kind of the, the, the very sad and tragic um, miscarriages that she had, her failed marriages, um, her career was definitely focused on, but in this kind of, again, like she was always kind of passively involved. So the fact that she became difficult when she was, um, abusing some substances on on set was kind of talked about but then her ambitions and her her drive was was I found a bit downplayed so overall as a film I I I thought it touched on some interesting points some of which I don't know if they are true or not but I can't say that I feel like it did her justice or it it presented her life in a way that would be in any way uplifting. I mean, it was very tragic and sad and quite, um, you know, made her into a, a, bit, a victim. Um, and I don't know if that's the best way to remember her, um, but in any case, it is one interpretation of her life. So that is Blonde, um, written and directed by Andrew Dominic. So the second film that I watched was a documentary and it was called Call Me Kate and it uh, chronicled the life of Katherine Hepburn. Now I, again, obviously you can see, I do enjoy um, the world of Hollywood and the kind of older world of Hollywood. I'm not as into Hollywood now, I would say, as I, I am, as I used to be, and I really used to enjoy the old uh, movie stars. And so Katherine Hepburn was one that I always found interesting, obviously because she was, uh, you know, a rule breaker, kind of an outsider in a lot of senses, where she was quite uh, assertive, you know, she wore pants when everyone was wearing skirts, she... Um, just had a different way about her and she had a really uh, interesting life as well and that's all depicted in this film. This new um, aspect of documentaries that this one used is that they do a lot of reproduction of like scenarios so because they didn't they take like an actress make her look like Kate from afar um, put her in a room reading a book or you see her looking looking out a window or walking in a garden or things like that so this documentary has those kind of snippets in it which I do find add a lot of context and give you kind of a sense of the person as you're listening to their voice the other thing I wasn't sure of about this one was whether or not the voiceover was actually Kate Catherine Hepburn or if they were using an AI generator which I know they did for the Andy Warhol Diaries, I think it was called on Netflix. And at first I found that very disorienting to hear his voice and know that it wasn't actually his voice. But after a few episodes, because it's more of an episodic documentary, um, I got very used to it and then I totally forgot that it was AI. And so I was, they didn't state that it was AI. So I'm assuming that they either had an actress whose voice sounded similar um, do the voiceover, or they were using actual clips from Katherine Hepburn talking in interviews over the years. And they did obviously feature a lot of those, but some a lot of those had the visuals attached to them at the time. So she was a really fascinating woman. Um, she had a rather, rather tragic um, situation happen to her in her youth. Her brother uh, died under mysterious circumstances, which they alluded to in the film was suicide, but which the family never admitted. Um, 
Katharine Hepburn was very assertive in Hollywood. She did create a lot of her own opportunities and um, kind of surrounded herself with people she felt were, um, were you know, good writers, good directors, those types of things. Um, she also did some stage and uh, I thought, yeah, I thought it was a great documentary. It's really interesting to learn more about her life and um, her retirement and her relationship with Spencer Tracy, which I did know about because I did read a book about their relationship years and years ago. Um, so I did kind of know about their, their, their long love affair, um, which uh, because he was married the whole time uh, to his wife and um, right up until his death, he was living with Kate, but um, was, was still married uh, so he was quite a twi uh, you know quite a tortured soul and uh, they talk about him obviously quite a bit being being Catherine's um, longtime love in the documentary as well and they also talked to Catherine's nephew um, because she never had children so yeah that one was very good um, after I was done with Call Me Kate, I watched You People, which was written by Jonah Hill and Kenya Barris and was directed by Kenya Barris. Um, so this is a comedy and I remember seeing the previews uh, or the trailer and thinking, yeah, um, I definitely want to check this one out because it's a really interesting take on modern day inter-religion and interracial relationships. And so this is about a uh, Muslim woman. Uh, her parents are Muslim. Eddie Murphy plays the father, um, who falls in love with a Jewish man, who is Jonah Hill. And uh, his family is, you know, portrayed as kind of the typical LA Jewish family, I guess. Um, and he is in his mid thirties. I believe she is as well. And they fall for each other and then they try to integrate their families and, um, integrate these two cultures. So, you know, I think both of the cultures are represented with a lot of humor, with a lot of tongue in cheek. Um, but also, you know, they're really talking about modern day racism, um, stereotypes that um, you, that different cultures project onto each other. <clears throat> um, uh, kind of, it was a very LA based relationship, so they would like go shopping and I, it, it was a very light romantic comedy on a lot of levels and then, but it also had these, these questions and overtones around um, around race and um, prejudice and um, parenting. The, the father of, of the woman's character and the mother of the man's character were the most dominant parents. And I found that a little bit off-putting for the film, to be honest, because they were just so dominant in every situation and the other parents didn't really contribute much or feel like important characters in the overall um, situ fam familial situation that was evolving which was that the parents were being so difficult that they were driving the, the two um, lovebirds apart and I thought you know that that's not that realistic like the other parents would really be more involved in this they would really have more to say the children would probably be talking to the other parents about what's going on with their the parent that's, that is being difficult so I just found that they, they didn't go as deep as I felt like a lot of those conversations should go um, and then of course it wrapped up very quickly and with this super happy ending um, which was great but and typical of these types of films but i also felt was was being very simplistic in terms of the the really important and i think valid conversations that it was trying to bring up as well about modern love and 
having different cultures and religions from your partner and, and what that means when you're getting together as a couple and how you negotiate that between your families. And so it's a really, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a very deep topic and, and I think in some ways the film addressed those, that depth and then in other ways it kind of glossed over it to keep it light and, and fluffy for the average romantic comedy viewer. Um, so I think that's all I have to say about you people. Yeah, that was two hours, that film. And then my fourth and final film that I watched while quilting this quilt was uh, the documentary Bob Ross, Happy Accidents, Betrayal, and Greed. And so I, I think most people who are familiar with American culture know who Bob Ross is. He painted happy little landscapes on PBS for many, many years. And uh, he is his iconic look has become just you know a mainstay in American culture and um, and so this is the story behind that. It is the story of how he became famous, um, his family, his relationships, his uh, his quest to uh, become famous and and help people learn to paint and love to paint, um, and also the people around him who basically um, uh, took advantage, I think it's, it's fair to say, took advantage of him um, and controlled his empire. Uh, and so he has a son who is part, was part of the documentary and several friends who stood by him in his life and um, they uh, are quite saddened by the fact that this one family, and I have forgotten their name, um, it was a husband and wife team who befriended Bob Ross, saw the opportunity to uh, profit and make, uh, make their own fortune off of his uh, personality, charm, and dynamics, and did so and continue to do so. Uh, and because Bob Ross died uh, very young of um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and didn't really get to um, understand his impact as fully as he could have uh, on American culture. And so, yeah, that was quite interesting. It's, um, it's unfortunate in a lot of ways because his son um, continues to paint, but uh, does not reap any of the reward of the success of the paints, um, t-shirts, mugs, chia pets, all the things that are being produced with Bob Ross's image and likeness on it. Um, his son gets no benefit from that. All of the royalties, all of the um, money goes to Bob Ross Inc., which is the company run by these two individuals who um, who used to be Bob Ross's business partners. Uh, and it's pretty sad, I think, because it goes to show how um, really horrible people can be. They were apparently badgering him on his deathbed to sign over his rights to them, even though I guess it didn't matter because he didn't sign over his rights. He passed them on to his half-brother and his uh, wife, and then they ended up signing the rights over, unbeknownst to the son, and um, took payouts and left uh, the name to these people who didn't really deserve the name. So quite an interesting story. I would recommend watching it because I think it is um, a, yeah, a fascinating story, a sad story, of, but also the joy that Bob Ross's work um, has brought to people is uh, incredible. And his philosophy that anyone could paint and everyone deserves to enjoy making art and, um, and be confident and happy in what they're making for themselves is, I think, a really beautiful message. Yeah. So that is, those are my four reviews of films that I watched while uh, working on this quilt. And if you are interested in seeing the final results of this quilt, um, then please stay tuned. I will be making an entire video that is just about this. And you can also see um, shots of it on my Instagram. 
Um, so you're welcome to go follow me over on Instagram. And all that, all those details are in the description box down below. Just so you know, I think I got about one section of this um, sewn down while I was chatting to you. So you can see uh, the length of time it takes to sew a binding onto the edge of a quilt. Um, I will be back again soon with another video. Thank you so much for watching.